Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new proverbial assault on the control system. I'm your host, John, aka Morgael, signing in for another installment in the original series, Questioning the Historical Narrative. And I'll try to put a playlist right here in the cards and in the description. Uh, herein, the primary topic will be certain crypts uh, deep beneath the surface of various cities and a proverbial metric ton of topics related, peripheral, and seemingly obscure to the catacombs themselves at first glance, but evidently all still within a common vein. To begin, our history has certainly been stolen from us. At some point in the past, there was undoubtedly a highly advanced worldwide civilization which left architectural evidence of its existence upon all continents, perhaps sans the Antarctic regions and perhaps not. From the megalithic structures found in Giza to Bolivia, Iran, and all along the Silk Road, which are all very ancient, to the relatively less ancient or for lack of a better term, more modern, exquisite cathedrals, sprawling Gothic mansions, deemed insane asylums, down to the mind-boggling civil engineering projects found with the star forts, deemed military garrisons later on, in places like Angkor Wat in Cambodia, with its amazing architecture and the enigmatic manipulation of the natural rainy season, to provide water for millions of people in the far reaches of the territory year-round. There is no doubt that the standard historical narrative simply fails to adequately account for our civilization's origins or the construction of even our modern cities, nor do we have a satisfactory explanation as to what exactly happened to the ancient builders. The mystery behind the demise of the ancients is not by accident, it would appear, as the conquerors in our alleged history went to great lengths to destroy their cultures, erase their languages and legacies from our consciousness and from the physical realm. Not to mention redesignating their amazing accomplishments as mundane cultural elements such as post offices, orphanages, and museums and the like. In practically all cases, the standard historical narrative is absolutely laughable, especially when it comes to the Americas, North, South, and Central. According to the learned Ivy Leagued boneheads responsible for writing the textbooks that comprise the curriculum up to the so-called higher educational levels, the American continents, according to them, were populated by savage simpletons who hunted wild animals for food as they were too daft to build a fence and raise livestock, according to them, right up into the point when the so-called Christian conquerors graced them with the basic elements of civilization and technology, not to mention Christianity at the edge of a sword, of course. Since the European world only stumbled upon the American continents by accident in the late 1400s, allegedly, then it's imperative for the historians to cram any and all architectural projects found in the Americas into a time frame of the last eh, really three or four hundred years at the most, with few exceptions. Um, remember, although Columbus allegedly discovered, in air quotes, discovered America in 1492, it took hundreds of years for them to fully explore, clear out, and map out the massive continents, uh, that's North, South, and Central America, and of course murder the people who lived there along the way, and ostensibly made a lot of them slaves too. Uh, since history is, of course, written by the winners of wars and dead men tell no tales, then we're stuck with books written by the progeny of said winning warrior Christians. According to mainstream sources, of course, Columbus believed he was on the east coast of India or like maybe in Japan or something until he died in 1506. 
This claim contradicts other official mainstream sources which claim the Europeans indeed realized they weren't on the east coast of India by the late 1490s while Columbus was still alive. So there's a definite contradiction there even in the very historical narratives. We find such contradictions in the official historical narrative all over the place. A telltale signature of lies being told, no matter how bold or unlikely. If it's written in a textbook and given the stamp of approval by the government, then it's as good as gold as far as most people are concerned in the world. In reality though, the truth will never contradict actuality, but this minor discrepancy I just mentioned regarding Columbus's wherewithal and lack of understanding Eratosthenes' globe earth model, which of course everyone knew for thousands of years, is but a scratch upon the surface of one of the greatest deceptions uncovered to date. While the mud flood slash Tartarian deception is complex, intriguing, and often clouded, its mysteries yet to be fully explained, it can be summarized in a nutshell as such. Once again, there was once, obviously, a worldwide advanced civilization which left testaments and traces in the form of very ancient monolithic and megalithic structures. Um, not that it only built with giant stones, but some cataclysm or a series of cataclysms apparently buried or destroyed many structures across the world which were not sturdy enough to withstand the likes of a great flood or barrages of earthquakes and tornadoes and that sort of thing or whatever cataclysms may be. Of course, after the most recent of such cataclysms, which appears to have been some sort of a, a great flood, um, we also find more recent evidence of this civilization in the form of uh, architectural projects which were well beyond their means, resources, and technology available to these alleged builders even just a few hundreds of years ago. The American continents have forced the writers of history into sort of painting themselves into a proverbial corner as we find countless examples of structures built in like the early 1800s during a time when such structures were not even necessary like the aforementioned exquisite and extraordinary insane asylums built all over the United States allegedly in the middle 1800s um, built to house thousands and thousands of basket cases for really actually sparse populations in the middle of nowhere while everyone is of course riding around in horse and buggies, living in shanties and at best log cabins according to the standard narrative, they were allegedly dumping million dollars into putting up these uh, gothic giant mansions and allegedly doing that to house the insane. Um, this doesn't make much sense when juxtaposed with the fact that, you know, people were li literally living in log cabins, right? So of course everyone knows that one of the first things any decent city populated by eh, a few thousand people living in log cabins, the first thing they need to do when they um, establish themselves as a city is build sprawling gothic castles to house their maybe couple hundred local nutcases. For more on that, take a look at a video I released pretty recently regarding the magnificent and luxurious asylums of the 1800s. I'll put a card here and a link in the description. So the devious web of intricate bullshit woven by the authors of modern history and parroted by indoctrinated historians must be crammed to fit within certain unfallible and unquestionable axioms of timelines of capital H history, even if obvious evidence contradicts such foundational premises and dating constraints of their narrative. You see, scientism is not just limited to theoretical astrophysics, no indeed, not just limited to the likes of NASA or the postulation of the speed of light. Uh, scientism's dangling tentacles creep over into the field of history due to an overarching narrative which was spun in order to control masses of people and sever our connection to the creator of all things as well as hide our true origins from ourselves and even our very purpose for being here on this world, the meaning of life if you will. You see, according to scientism, also known as lions, we all evolved from this primordial ooze 
a pile of slop which one day, millions of years ago, through random chance coincidence, somehow magically managed to manifest itself spontaneously into living organisms, then somehow reproduce, eventually growing into larger, more complex life forms somehow. Of course, there is no evidence for this evolutionary theory. Inanimate chemicals simply cannot magically and incidentally spark into life, even in its most simple of forms, like single-celled organisms which are microscopic, really mysterious and extremely complex, complete with DNA and the ability to self-replicate. In the laboratory, scientists have, of course, been trying to create living organisms from scratch or from the chemicals available to them. Uh, we know exactly what types of chemicals compromise single-celled organisms and complicated organisms, but they've been unable to create even a single cell or a single seed from scratch, but not for lack of trying, of course. Furthermore, such single-celled organisms reproduce by what's called binary fission, uh, or in the case of yeast, what's called budding. In either case, this means that the parent and child single-celled organisms are genetically identical. No wiggle room for natural selection or genetic evolution to gradually upgrade a simple form of life into a more complex form of life. So the concept that ancient single-celled organisms somehow <laughs> manifested out of the primordial ooze and then also somehow evolved into complex multi-celled organisms like say sponges then into like worms and then fishes and then fishes somehow flopped out of the water survived on the land grew legs and wings and flew around yeah th this concept of evolution is by all definitions exactly pseudoscience and has indeed been completely destroyed by common sense and observable reality. Of course, by making such a statement, I must be some sort of Bible-thumping evangelical Christian because we all know that only religious fanatics don't believe in evolution, right? Because the Bible said so. Of course, I'm being facetious, but the point of this brief excursion into the topic of evolution is to highlight how important it is for the Archons, these spiritually wicked entities sitting in high places of the world, to sever our connection to the Most High, the Creator, with whom we can commune if only we hold the necessary faith and have the necessary tools available to us on a cultural level. With all that being said, according to the mainstream paradigm, we modern Americans are the apex of the vortex of random biological engineering. The chemical lottery winners of infinite space provided the necessary building blocks for life thanks to the death of distant stars billions of years ago, and the sheer infinitude of space and time eventually allowed for life on Earth to manifest itself spontaneously, mysteriously, and irrepeatably, of course, over time eventually evolving into the vast spectrum of living organisms found here on Earth. Yes, even plants, if you can believe that nonsense. Yeah, that's right, broccoli is your distant cousin, and so are stink bugs, and shih tzus, and parakeets, romaine lettuce, and dung beetles. Yeah, we're all cousins uh, with the Venus flytrap, and jumbo shrimp, and crab apples, and bald eagles. According to the standard scientific narrative, we all have evolved from a single common ancestor a little single-celled organism that magically appeared out of the primordial ooze. From such a ridiculous vantage point that is the standard modern worldview, it is unthinkable that our ancestors thousands of years ago could have possibly been more advanced than us. Uh, this is why sites like Puma Punca in Bolivia did not, according to official history, have such luxuries as even the wheel. Let alone power tools or large machining capabilities, yet the evidence suggests exactly that. Therefore, the standard historical narrative claims this massive monolithic site was constructed by troglodytes with stone chisels and just tons and tons of time and even more slaves. The Great Pyramids in Giza are still an enigma as to their purpose and function and how they were built. Uh, the Grand Temple of Angkor uh, in Cambodia was constructed in the deep jungles, uh, according to legend, overnight, but of course by naked savages running around the woods using bamboo scaffolds, and their highest technology was literally the rope tied to their elephant's ass.
countless examples of ancient structures worldwide which don't fit into the standard narrative of history could be cited, but in today's video we're going to delve into more modern examples of the absurdity known as American history, the catacombs. So most of us or many of us are familiar with the grand catacombs of France and Rome and all over Europe really, but underground Greco-Roman structures complete with columns and arches and really intricate designs and beautifully ornately decorated, which are claimed to have been built after the cities above them. Uh, these are the ones over in Europe. Grand columns, stone arches, intricate decorations allegedly built beneath the streets of modern cities. That is according to the standard historical narrative. Now that we're living in the age of revelation, many have reconsidered this frankly laughable narrative, hypothesizing that such catacombs were not actually built beneath the existing streets and foundations of cathedrals and stuff after the fact, but instead the subterranean structures repurposed and redesignated as catacombs were actually in place long before the modern cities on the surface level even existed. At some point, it appears that five to 10 meters of existing cityscapes were at some point instantly covered by just billions of tons of mud, with examples that one could cite of this fact in practically every city in America and most cities around the world. First off, let's consider how difficult and dangerous it is to unearth bedrock out of an open area, or the task of creating structurally sound tunnel systems beneath an uninhabited landscape. And that's using modern equipment. It is extremely arduous to undertake such projects and must be handled with the greatest of care. Even in our technological age, let alone thousands of years ago, when there were no power tools, no gas-powered hydraulic excavators, no bulldozers, no cranes, none of that. Uh, couple that with the claim that the ancients were doing such things underneath existing cities is a rather tall order indeed. Of course, the Egyptians, the Romans, and the Greeks of old are universally understood to be architectural and engineering geniuses, easily completing such seemingly impossible feats with the limited tools and technology available to them, and we're fine with that because they have the mystique of existing long ago, and because they had thousands of years and plenty of slave labor at their disposal to allegedly do so, along with age-old economic resources and, most importantly, Importantly, uh, a king to take credit for the fruits of such amazing labors of many thousands of people over long periods of time. But what about in America? Remember, American Greco-Roman architecture must be forced to fit within the time constraints of the post-colonization period, which means the historical narrative must adhere to the time span of like the last 700 years, give or take, at the very most. And we never even had a king to take credit for any of it. Again, it is claimed that Columbus discovered America in 1492, Europeans did not begin colonizing until the early 1500s, and most of their effort was spent simply surviving in makeshift wood frame shanties for quite some time after that. Uh, according to Wikipedia, the infallible source of truth and perpetual correctness in this world, the oldest so-called military fort in the U.S. is Castillo de San Marco in St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, supposedly constructed in 1672, uh, primarily by Native American slaves using a very rare type of stone called coquina, which is shell fragments and limestone sediment usually found underwater, but in Florida they have some mines that they claim the stuff came from. Uh, it's a very difficult material to extract from the earth, miles away from the job site at the very least, possibly underwater. Not to mention difficult to transport, difficult to manipulate once transported, difficult to work with all around due to the sheer weight and density of the stones. Uh, this star fort is extremely impressive, as they always tend to be, but the fascinating thing here is the fact that the historical know-it-alls claim that a project as impressive as St. Augustine's star fort were built by unskilled slave labor. The Native Americans who were supposedly running around naked in the woods with feathers on their heads until the Spanish conquistadors showed up, conquering them and bringing them the light of Christianity by, on the tips of their swords, drenched with the blood of their savage kinfolk. 
without any infrastructure to speak of, namely roads, bridges, or your friendly neighborhood Home Depot, uh, the savage simpletons were able to do the impossible and build this fantastic structure perfectly, which still stands to this day, hundreds and hundreds of years later, retaining walls built right up against the corrosive salt waters of the Atlantic Ocean, surviving the tests of time, hurricanes and all, they sure don't build them like they used to back in the late 1600s. One very important point to remember is that the Spanish military had allegedly been using wood-framed forts up until the point where English combatants attacked St. Augustine in the 1660s, practically destroying everything in the city and around it, including their paltry wood-framed forts, making such a sturdy stone-framed fort a military necessity. Again, this is according to the official narrative and again was supposedly in 1672 when it started being built. Now, let's rewind about 150 years and travel down to Lima, Peru, beneath the convent of San Francisco, again, not in California, but this is in Lima, Peru, in the convent of San Francisco, to the crypt deep beneath. It's claimed that around 1530, just 35 or 40 years after the continents of America were discovered, in air quotes, of course, the Spanish conquistadors managed to build the Cathedral of San Francisco in Lima, along with the catacombs below, an extremely impressive undertaking which would challenge even the most advanced contractors of our modern age with the advantage of our current infrastructure, supply lines, high-power technological equipment, and the rest. Not to mention, this cathedral was constructed during a time when the conquistadors were still pretty busy murdering the natives for the noble cause of making them Christians, of course. The official claim that this was done using manual labor during a time when Peru was still allegedly like wild country without any infrastructure to speak of is simply unbelievable in the sense uh, that I frankly don't believe it rather than the hyperbole that it's just impressive. So, according to the standard history, the Spanish were able to build stone temples underground for the dead, as opposed to just digging a six-foot-deep rectangular hole using a shovel, as we do to this day. And they did this just for shits and giggles. However, it would take the same Spanish Empire another 150 years to replace their wooden military forts in St. Augustine, Florida, to protect their city from an onslaught of British attacks, which they knew were coming anyway. This is frankly patently absurd, so we left unbelievable in the dust miles ago. Uh, if they were building wooden military forts into the 1600s in Florida, in very close proximity to the existing ports on the eastern seaboard, where their fledgling infrastructure would have been most concentrated and most effective, but at the same time, it's claimed that they were building large stone cathedrals and subterranean catacombs, similar to those found in France, but admittedly smaller, thousands of miles away from their sprouting and inadequate infrastructure, this makes zero sense. You would think that military forces would have taken top priority over a bone pit, especially during the tumultuous and volatile era of colonization. But apparently, according to the mainstream, oh, and I say colonization, but we really do mean genocide, don't we? I mean, that's what we're talking about here. But apparently, according to the mainstream narrative, the Spanish conquistadors must have immediately broken ground and immediately began construction of these catacombs in Peru as top priority one and simply let their wooden military forts in Florida uh, suffice until over 100 years later, almost 150 years later, until their enemies eventually and inevitably burned them all down because that's what enemies do to wood forts and they knew this. Um, thus necessitating the construction then at that point of the rather impossible task of building St. Augustine's Star Fort, the Castillo de la whatever it was, I mentioned it earlier, uh, once again using unskilled Native Americans as slaves to build the damn thing. <laughs> yeah, sure they did. For the Spanish conquistadors to proactively build bone pits at great peril and expense as a priority, whilst way later on, reactively building similarly difficult military forts, really as an afterthought, just doesn't bode well at all. 
Frankly, the absurdity of this narrative, when inspected through the lens of a new hypothesis, applying the Zetetic method becomes clear. Whomever is responsible for fabricating the ridiculous narrative we now call official history, they did a great job, and their liaria held up for hundreds of years. Only after the internet sleuths of our modern era began viewing the world and our underlying belief system skeptically during this age of revelation have these absurd lies been exposed. Indeed, it takes an average person to read a book and memorize the contents therein. It takes an average person to later on regurgitate those contents. Uh, but it takes a moderately skeptical person applying rational thought, replacing the burden of proof upon the incumbent establishment slash conventional wisdom in order to expose such a grand deception. What actually makes way more sense than the absurd yarn of the official narrative is the concept that there was actually vast, highly complex, existing infrastructure and technological cultures in place when the Americas were quote-unquote discovered. While this might seem far-fetched at first glance, the evidence for such a hypothesis is frankly overwhelming, undeniable, and found all over the United States, and similarly all over the world, in many different forms. Were the Native Americans actually savage simpletons as claimed, running around the woods naked with feathers in their hats, smacking their lips making turkey noises? Is that what they were really doing? Uh, many lacking written languages, all certainly lacking the high technology of even a wheel or an axle. How is it possible that we find very ancient civil engineering and megalithic constructs in the Americas which were clearly left behind by a culture which possessed very high-tech capabilities, even according to the sparse remnants of what we have left of their culture, after it was ripped apart by the gospel bringers, unfortunately, even according to the regurgia parrots lording over the historical narratives. When you couple the facts surrounding worldwide sites which fly in the face of the accepted historical rhetoric with related similar pieces of evidence all over America, the standard historical narrative goes right out the window. In fact, upon logical inspection, the concept that the American continents were inhabited by a highly advanced society responsible for creating great cities, supporting infrastructures, roads, bridges, amazing civil engineering accomplishments, who likely were murdered, their cultures erased from history by European invaders is not very far-fetched at all. What insidious and deceptive tactics were used by said invaders in order to usurp such a grand society? If this all happens to be somewhat close to the truth, then is it possible that the overthrown culture found in the Americas may have been the last remnants of the worldwide civilizations we sometimes refer to as Tartaria? I realize that from the viewpoint of someone who is well-educated or rather well-indoctrinated in the dogmas of standard textbook history, this will all sound batshit crazy, or at least far-fetched. I would implore anyone scoffing at the spirit of this video, and really the movement in general, to reconsider the foundations of their historical belief system and their overall paradigm in general, specifically looking for discrepancies in the narrative as well as architectural accomplishments which simply could never have been successfully undertaken, let alone even attempted, by naked natives running around in the woods with feathers in their hats, who lacked even a pair of pants among them all, really. One need not look any further than the sites of Machu Picchu, also in Peru, Angkor Wat in Cambodia, the Great Pyramids of Giza, or the ones all over China for that matter, or the ones in South America, for very ancient proofs of concept. But in terms of the more modern or even American examples of feats which were not within the capabilities of early pilgrims as claimed, or even our forebears of the 1800s for that matter, maybe reconsider the Panama Canal, Mount Rushmore, or the Golden Gate Bridge for just a few examples. I'll put a card to a playlist of videos I've created touching on these very topics as well as a link in the description. Uh, ask yourself, 
Is it possible that the colonization period of the Americas didn't actually entail enlightening savage natives with Christianity by force and the, with the threat of violence, ultimately delivering them the gospel by murdering their families and erasing their cultural heritage by force? How very Christian of them indeed. Uh, but instead, was there some sort of steampunk society already in place here? which were usurped, overthrown, and covered up with a veneer of American manifest destiny, and fairy tales of the practically overnight creation of massive cities housing millions, like San Francisco. Uh, I'm planning to do a video soon on the orphan train, which is uh, one potential part of this hypothesis, which might explain how they pulled off such a thing. Without going into too much detail here, it basically entails the concept of, well, first killing off the existing population that was already here, clearing the cities of the bodies, filling the existing subterranean buildings and tunnels with hundreds of thousands of corpses, not to mention probably mass graves as well, but calling some of these places catacombs. Orphans were then shipped into the existing cities and they were given some story or another, doesn't really matter what they were told, but they were given some story to explain exactly who built the cities they were now sent to inhabit. Exactly what was told to them really is immaterial as such orphans were never going to be the ones writing the history books, of course not. That task would be left to certain key figures who would have to be, at least to some degree, incentivized to spin yarns which adhere to this standard narrative that we now call history, entailing the Native Americans being savage simpletons and the Christian Europeans being the ones who built the cities we still find in existence in the Americas today, although many of the structures that were already here have definitely been destroyed. Finally, once the orphans and their descendants eventually died off, maybe even two or three generations would have to die off, in order for the experiences of those great-great-grandparents to have become basically old wives' tales, replaced by the narrative found ubiquitously in all the history books, becoming the new truth, which all historians will attest to because, well, they all read the same books. They certainly had the ability to essentially manually photoshop photographic images since practically the dawn of photo processing, much to the contrary of what most people believe. The companies had the capability of photo manipulation back in the mid-1800s, like right after the camera was invented, but many sources will tell you that such a thing wasn't possible until way later, but there's evidence of this going on all the time. We find a sparse few examples of construction photos of American landmarks being created. Uh, there is evidence of photo manipulation of vanilla skies, double exposures, up to 30 exposures if it was done by pros, in order to create the illusion that, say, 100 semi-skilled laborers sculpted Mount Rushmore, for example, using dynamite, or perhaps they deleted what appeared to be telephone poles and power lines in eras prior to the alleged electrification of cities as well. So there is photographic evidence of very such photo manipulation going on with uh, like construction photos of some of these more modern, very old buildings, often attributed to this pre-colonized civilization here in America. We certainly don't have a full, clear picture as so much time has passed, as so many pieces of evidence have been destroyed or hidden, our minds as children were filled with absolute nonsense via the educational curriculum, uh, those who experience such repopulation of cities are long dead, and their grandchildren, who may have heard their old wives' tales, are also long dead, or simply they were always incredulous that their old grandma was clearly off of her rocker since, well, all the textbooks written by super smart Ivy League geniuses passed down to the official educational curriculum, which is memorized and regurgitated by students to this very day. So we're left with a culture full of people who look at structures in the Americas like the Mayan pyramids or the massive megaliths found in Pumapunku in Peru, and they simply see evidence for copper chiseling slaves who were simply forced to work long hours and manually move hundred ton stones dozens of miles using some ridiculous roll along a log method, which is really quite absurd, especially considering they're at an elevation over 12,600 feet, so they're above the natural tree line and trees don't even grow in the entire region. 
or they will see things like the incredible ruins of structures, some apparently melted by maybe some form of directed energy weapon along the Silk Road, for example, and figure the historians have it right, and simple troglodytes without any infrastructure or machinery somehow manage to manually chisel through some of the hardest stones known to humans using just primitive tools which are simply too soft metals or stones to cut through like granite and diorite and andesite and very hard stones like that. And then, you know, they'll see that and go on about their day without a second thought because why would the textbooks be filled with misinformation and lies, right? Like what could a possible motive for that be according to the sort of standard paradigm, right? But the catacombs in Lima, Peru, beneath the Cathedral of San Francisco are a different story as we're dealing with right at the period of colonization of the Americas. So during the time when most European settlers were living in log cabins or wood frame shanties for sure, uh, the Spanish conquistadors were slave driving natives in Lima to somehow unearthing millions of tons of bedrock and constructing elaborate tunnel systems therein using basically primitive tools just to house the bones of the dead Again, even in our modern age, a funeral consists of one hole in the ground and one pine box and one corpse. The concept of building elaborate, ornate, grandiose underground structures with vaulted ceilings simply for funerary purposes is absolutely ridiculous. The concept that they went in after the existing foundations of the building were put up and then later on went down and dug out such crypts is even more so ridiculous, but in many cases that is what they claim. Uh, in the case of the catacombs in Lima, uh, they're not the only examples of subterranean tunnel systems found in the Americas. Uh, for example, in North America, in Seattle, Washington, there are subterranean tunnels which span the entire old city. If you do just a bit of digging into this topic, it houses one of the most laughable and ridiculous bits of historical narrative you will ever hope to find, and that says a lot, because they've got some really stupid claims made in the historical narrative. So in Seattle, they claim that, according to Wikipedia, the Seattle catacombs were built in the mid-1800s, but fell into disuse after, get this, the streets were elevated. That's right. I'll read that last bit again. They claim the Seattle catacombs were built in the mid-1800s, but they fell into disuse after the streets were elevated. Now, maybe the concept isn't coming across fully, but the absurdity of such a statement is difficult to grasp, especially if you've never done any sort of construction work. But the concept of elevating all of the street levels in a city is patently absurd, even in a modern sense. But for the technologically lacking era of the mid-1800s, it is beyond unbelievable in the realm of fairy tales and leprechauns. Then, as if that wasn't enough, if you look up exactly when these streets were allegedly elevated, you'll find this also on Wiki. After the Great Seattle Fire of June 6, 1889, new construction was required to be of masonry and the town streets were regraded one to two stories higher. That's right. Read it again. After the Great Seattle Fire of June 1889, new construction was required to be of masonry and the town streets were regraded one to two stories higher. So what I'm trying to figure out is exactly how does one go about building new streets and buildings on top of old streets and buildings in an entire city, full stop. I mean, I would say, how would one do such a thing with modern equipment? But I guarantee you that if you asked a general contractor who specializes in that sort of thing, yeah, just look in the phone book for street raising contractors, I'm sure you'll find tons to be sure. He's going to laugh you out of the room, though. Ask a general contractor. Ask a civil engineer. Hell, even if you called up the Army Corps of Engineers or like HUD and asked them for a, a price quote on raising the city streets in your area by one to two stories, not to mention raising the ground level with that citywide, they would prepare a nice padded cell and a straitjacket for you at one of the many fine, sprawling Gothic mansions we call insane asylums, maybe even one that was built in the early 1800s. 
So the official narrative is that one, Seattle catacombs were built in the mid 1800s, but fell into disuse after the streets were elevated. And two, after the great Seattle fire of June 1889, new construction was required to be of masonry and the town's streets were regraded one to two stories higher. This is absolutely ridiculous, but since it's written in the history books and it's found on Wiki, then that is clearly what occurred. And clearly, there are indeed one or two stories beneath the existing ground level city infrastructure. Then laymen and architectural scholars alike just accept this absurd narrative without a second thought. Reason being, it's in all the textbooks, so it must be true. Uh, really, how gullible of us to just accept such nonsense for all these years. Uh, thank God for such revelations coming into the light. By the way, such tunnel systems in North America are all redesignated as prohibition rum running tunnels, and most are closed down and off limits. Uh, you'll probably face jail time if you're caught trespassing in such tunnels, but in South America, many of them are called catacombs. In a sense, the catacomb story does a great job of physically and sort of emotionally covering up the really quite amazing architecture to be found deep beneath such cities in these so-called catacombs. Uh, people see thousands and thousands of skeletons and look right past the grand architecture founded upon hewn stone, carved out deep beneath the bedrock, beneath existing structures, and only see the skulls and don't look past the bones and femurs. And what about the street raising claim in Seattle? Isn't it more likely that an existing city was like buried five to 10 meters or like of mud, which was then later excavated in some cases, but in many cases, there are still levels of cities beneath the new cities. We have evidence of the overthrowing and usurping of the reins of power in this world by a group of really quite parasitic and deceptive psychopaths who potentially killed off or at least imprisoned and indentured an entire population, then introduced orphan populations into the milieu who were given some narrative or another as to how those cities got there. The orphans weren't the ones who wrote the history books. Uh, that was left to some Freemasonic Ivy Leaguers who likely couldn't be trusted to make a proper sandwich, let alone attempt to like raise the street levels and ground level of an entire city using manual labor. But the writings of these overpaid Ivy League Freemasonic shills were ultimately the winners of the war, so their narrative becomes the bona fide truth of the land de jure, and their fanciful musings are then parroted by the formal historians of our day, who also are unlikely capable of making a proper sandwich, nor raising citywide street levels using manual labor either, propped up by the educational system we have today, which is actually a system of indoctrination and mind control rather than mind expanding or mind challenging. Our world has been set up to celebrate and reward those who walk the path of degrees, memorize and regurgitate the information found in the textbooks, and point and laugh at anyone daft enough to point out that their story of history is full of holes. Uh, probably manholes, I reckon about one to two stories above the original ground level, which is no longer in use. <laughs> Laughing out effing loud. For real. Many people stuck in this quagmire called the standard paradigm tend to point to space aliens to explain how human beings in our history could be treated like cattle in yesterday's obituary section respectively. From the reptilian shapeshifters described by David Icke to the extraterrestrial builders of pre-ancient sites postulated by the likes of Giorgio Tsoukalos or Eric Von Dannegan, a la TV's Ancient Aliens blockbuster franchise, as much as I love the show and, and actually agree with many of the concepts as perfectly possible, as the notion of ancient aliens walking among us while we kick ass and chew bubblegum when available is actually a very cogent hypothesis in my opinion. Uh, this statement is more so true from within the geocentric static planar hypothesis, as opposed to the heliocentric hypothesis, where our extraterrestrial cousins are probably phoning home much closer than you think. 
No, we're not talking about the kind of aliens who drink Modelo's and do mando trabajo, but rather the kind of aliens who potentially just skip across the plane from their home geothermal pocket two doors down from beyond the Antarctic. Potentially. This is actually far more plausible than the previous theory involving the ETs traveling across hypothetical light years through infinite space to get here after somehow finding us, probably from some other hypothetical, non-existing galaxy. For from the viewpoint of actuality, wherein the infinite space hypothesis no longer holds any water, as the prerequisite geological rotundity and axial rotation, not to mention orbital velocities, simply do not exist, could not exist, and have never produced a shred of physical data to suggest that they do in fact exist. That is what is so fascinating about the standard heliocentric model, and the believers in it. The figures, in terms of the incomprehensible speeds involved with orbital trajectories and axial rotation, grew larger and larger, faster and faster, as the lie grew in a similar fashion proportionally. At first, the solar system imagined by the likes of Eratosthenes or Hipparchus of ancient Greece, the hypothetical Orth was actually stationary in their imaginings. Eventually, they tell us the historical figures of Copernicus and Galileo Galilei imagined the solar system to be in rapid motions, uh, which were subsequently dwarfed by the ultimate velocities we have now with the galactic theory. Uh, which was indeed first postulated in 1929 by a dude named Hubble. The creators of science fiction quickly latched on to the imaginings of the likes of Hubble's distant galaxies postulations, all containing many thousands or millions of suns in theory, complete with their planets and moons in the deep night sky only visible with the high-powered telescopes owned by the Freemasons, allegedly. Then came NASA, who confirmed the entire line of thought which was birthed by Eratosthenes in ancient Greece by flying through space a quarter of a million miles to go walk on the moon and even eventually play golf on the moon. According to the lying Freemasons at NASA, it's worth mentioning that NASA was indeed founded as a direct brainchild of many Nazi scientists smuggled into the United States during Project Paperclip after World War II, wherein both allied superpowers, being the Russians and the US, secretly commandeered highly ranked Nazi party members after the fall of Berlin in World War II. NASA's original rocket program was indeed headed by Werner von Braun, for example, who was just one such high-profile Nazi party member who may have otherwise faced things like the Nuremberg Trials, uh, who is, was then put on United States official payroll in high-profile positions, making a lot of money. Now, this is not to necessarily over-demonize the Nazis, uh, they definitely get plenty of that by the mainstream, but it is absolutely certain that the generation who endured World War II, so like my grandparents and many of y'all's great-grandparents, um, they would have absolutely been livid to the point of probable revolution had they known that the government was, in fact, secretly plucking up Nazis changing their identities, giving them new identities, some in some cases saving them from like the electric chair or whatever, the firing squad, however they would do it, and employing them in high paying, high profile, critical government related positions all over the spectrum for myriad practical and rather psychopathic purposes. The main reason the United States and the Russians wanted the Nazi scientists and other cultural engineers was the fact that German technology was, by all accounts, far superior to any other nation during that era. Indeed, known historical warfare had never seen the likes of the German army during that era. The other primary reason that the Nazi scientists and the social engineers of the Nazi party were so irresistible to the US and to Russia as well was because of their similar cultural stemming techniques in the realm of like mass sterilization of so-called inferior human gene pools and then the golden chalice, Germany's mastery over the art of propaganda. Whatever your opinion of the Nazis happens to be, which is a broad and polarized range indeed, one must admit that the Nazis were master propagandists. 
So it's no wonder that between the likes of the Disney company, responsible for creating much space porn propaganda during the time leading up to the Apollo moon landing hoax, right alongside of aforementioned Nazi Werner von Braun. The U.S. government dumped untold sums of black budget money into crafting the subconscious illusion that space travel was an inevitable end to the efforts made by the likes of NASA and Russia's Roscosmos after the advent of the other galaxies in space hypotheses, again first imagined by Hubble in 1929. Uh, people actually started calling it the Space Age before anyone had even attempted to travel into space was all very much in the realm of theory, and I would say very much in the realm of fantasy would be a better phrase. We certainly find evidence of collusion in this deception between Russia and the United States, further suggesting the Nazi propaganda campaign wasn't just a U.S. national problem, but was coordinated, much in the vein of Orwellian 1984, wherein two distant wherein two geologically distant, powerful nations pretend on the surface to be less than friendly or even like Cold War enemies in order to manipulate populations using what is essentially fear porn. The Russian satellite Sputnik scare is a perfect example of such collusion in order to drum up public demand for a space program on both sides of the Atlantic. The U.S. media hyped up what is probably a very high-altitude plane, like a spy plane, or maybe an array of them peppered over key major cities. Perhaps it was something more natural, like a comet that they ended up calling Sputnik. They called it a Russian spy satellite in order to scare the United States citizens into, like, writing their congressmen to throw infinite sums of money perpetually at NASA forever and ever and ever. Oh, not to mention ever-increasing sums of money every year. I think it's like up to over 20 billion a year that NASA gets of yours and my tax dollars. So every time you have to pay an extra, you know, 10 cents a dollar for gas or whatever, or maybe much more than that, I don't know, some portion of one of those pennies is going straight to NASA. So they can, they have you to thank for it. So not only was NASA deeply incestual with what remained of the brains of the Nazi party after World War II, and this is even admittedly so by the government, many decades after the fact they admitted to it, uh, with clandestine government operations like aforementioned paperclip, but they were also integrally tied to Satanism via the likes of Jack Parsons, who is literally the JP in JPL. And if you know anything about NASA, then certainly you've heard of JPL as they have been integral partners with NASA since the very beginning. Uh, furthermore, and in my opinion, most importantly, uh, NASA is clearly and unequivocally infested with Freemasons, which must be stated in the same breath with certain caveats. Uh, for one, I will say it here that I'm not a Freemason, I've never been a Freemason, never even been inside of a Freemasonic temple, um, my grandfather was, I believe, basically a high up Freemason with a group called Ahepa, which is American Hellenistic something, something, something. Uh, I, I don't know much about Ahepa, so perhaps that group isn't exactly, you know, related or akin to the oh so famous secret societies like the Scottish Rite Path of Freemasonry, which I'm actually rather familiar with due to my research into the conspiracies which have obviously occurred throughout history as a direct result of Freemasons. Uh, the point is, while Freemasonry is certainly very strange with their secret rituals, secret proceedings, secret handshakes, uh, historical banning of women from their ranks and even within their secret hideouts, uh, most Freemasons fall within the first three degrees of Masonry. The, they're called neophytes, or the, the first three degrees is called the Blue Lodge. And these guys, they have to pay their dues every month in cash, and they get certain benefits from the networking and trust that is instantly established with other Freemasons within their lodge and beyond. Again, this is very strange to me because uh, very same men who are Freemasons are awarded no-bid contracts or shown favoritism in the business world by Brothers of the Craft um, are the very same ones that parade around for the free markets and how capitalism uh, only works if the free markets are left free. And when you've got secret brotherhoods manipulating markets on vast levels, that is anything but a free market, of course. 
Um, but at any rate, these blue lodgers or these neophytes to Freemasonry are ultimately not privy to what exactly the so-called worshipful masters of the lodges are actually doing with all of that money and clout that they rake in from their members' periodic fees and all of the connections that they have with like the government. So these guys definitely get lucrative government contracts, which only ever go to Freemason-associated contractors and will never go to the un washed masses. Uh, this is really just scratching the surface, but anyone who swears a blood oath at their secret boys club and promises to like lie, cheat, or even steal, or potentially, if necessary, kill for the sake of the lodge or to protect the secrets of their brotherhood, they are expected to do so, uh, expected to never divulge their secrets upon the pains of incrementally, exceedingly gruesome deaths as they level up in degrees. So like, Every time they level up a degree, they have to take a new oath with a more and more gruesome and sort of frightening method of being murdered by their brothers. Uh, so the Freemasons cannot be trusted to tell the truth if the truth happens to um, adversely affect their lodge or one of their fellow Masons. Uh, the problem with such secret oaths by bizarre bedfellows was perfectly illustrated during the presidential election between George Bush Jr., you know, W., and John Kerry, uh, both of whom were deeply embedded into the world of secret societies during their Yale years, just actually two years apart. So these guys knew each other in college, and they were like doing weird rituals in coffins in college together. Uh, as they were both brothers in the Order of Skull and Bones, incidentally stemmed from a Nazi death cult. And this is the sort of the signature, very famous secret society found at Yale. So while the secret societies much aligned to Freemasonry can get pretty bizarre, and at the higher levels are certainly associated with what one might call Satanism, or better still, Luciferianism, or even better, Jabulonism, but we're straying too far from the main point here, which is to say that most Freemasons are essentially useful idiots to the pinnacles of their hierarchy, as far as their superiors in their higher ranks are concerned, and it's no wonder that practically all astronauts who claim to have been to space have definitely been Freemasons, which means instantly by default that while they may not necessarily be evil because they are Freemasons, they definitely cannot necessarily be trusted when it comes to telling the truth about some topic which they have been ordered or sworn under the pain of death by their respective lodges to publicly admit. So NASA was created by Nazis, Satanists, and Freemasons, and we wonder why they've lied their asses off since the day of their inception, and we wonder why we continue to fork over tens of billions of our dollars of our money to them every year in order to deceive us about infinite space. But what does this have to do with the catacombs beneath the cities, built before the high technologies of even horse and buggies? Well, I personally believe that in order to misdirect the collective consciousness of the intelligent world at large, it was somehow necessary for the magicians of propaganda like Goebbels and Disney to keep our eyes on the imaginary frontier in space and away from the very ground which we walk upon. I have read in books upon the subject of propaganda and mind control that one very necessary component of mass mind control or predictive programming is to keep the victims in a permanent state of internal conflict by really confounding their core beliefs, which essentially makes them unbalanced within and confused as a baseline natural state. So, for example, if a person has lived their entire lives upon a static plane and yet has been convinced since their formative years as little children that they instead have lived that same life stuck to the side of a spinning sphere, flying through space at incomprehensible speeds five directions at once, in spite of all the direct, tangible evidence to the very contrary of that, it places them in a malleable state emotionally and mentally wherein they can be convinced of practically anything so long as the same system of authority which brought them the truth as children claims this thing to be true, whatever it happens to be. 
With that being said, it's no wonder that otherwise intelligent people, even those with experience in architecture and engineering, have been convinced of patently absurd notions like they raised the street level one to two stories in Seattle after the Great Fire in the mid-1800s. Let's not forget that practically all major cities in North America suffered from some form of great fire or another, if not multiple great fires in the same city, which allegedly forced the still ashen public to start all over and build another city on top of that one. In case of San Francisco's historical great fires, it forces the already crunched timeline within the last few hundred years here in America, where San Francisco, California supposedly went from a small, like one horse town into a sprawling metropolis complete with cathedrals, insane asylums extraordinaire, mansion style orphanages, etc. Within a few short decades, such a city allegedly sprung up in San Francisco, California. Uh, and in many cases, other cities around the United States before the roads were even paved. And same thing with San Francisco. So, yep, they were building Gothic cathedrals and chateau-style orphanages and, and that sort of thing, but didn't get around to paving the roads just yet. So, whom exactly is responsible for such grandiose deceptions spanning multiple generations? In my experience, human beings are inherently decent, loving, and generous, not really deceptive in any way, unless it's for some selfish personal gain in some cases. Uh, most people are concerned with their immediate surroundings, with their own personal agendas and well-beings, and you know that of their family. But it seems inconceivable to the average person that some other group of shadowy despots with designs on siphoning our wealth via acts like the non-federal, non-reserve, non-bank act of 1913, uh, which was ultimately to enslave the population who call themselves free. Not to mention the average person would never dream that the same ilk of insidious, incestuous cronies would conspire to cover up our history by controlling the authoritative collegiate curriculum surrounding the broad spectrum of history, wherein, in order to make a certain claim about history, uh, it must be sourced in some ancient tome by this historical cleric or the other. And finally, of course, for these reptilian shapeshifters from the Crab Nebula to put on human skin suits and lie about the very ground we've always walked upon. Of course, I'm being uh, equally sarcastic as facetious with that last one, but you surely catch my drift. Uh, really, who would ever thunk that history and theoretical sciences would entail such elaborate deceptions and control systems put in place to enslave everyone, sans the few elitist cronies sitting at the top of the proverbial pyramid who reap in the lion's share of the benefits of our cultural collective fruits. Uh, this is exactly how organizations like NASA are able to pull off scams, like the moon landing hoax, because they are very much compartmentalized and set up in a hierarchy so that people follow orders and don't really know what the other departments are doing. They're able to pull this sort of thing off because the mainstream normies of the world inherently trust the government and as such trust NASA by default, but at the same time, sidestream pariahs who will argue all day long about little gray men and little green men wearing their tinfoil hats and do not trust the government for any reason, even they, for some reason, have given NASA an arm of the US military and therefore funded and managed by the very same government they give them a pass and not only trust them, but oftentimes publicly cheerlead an outcry to increase NASA's annual budget. Increase it. Even those who are aware of the historically nefarious and manipulative Freemasons use Hegelian tactics, unfair practices, and bizarre rituals indeed, somehow give the Freemasonic astronauts of NASA a pass and even trust them to boldly tell the biggest and most ridiculous lies of all time. If it were to turn out that those elitist sycophants and their arconic controllers were actually reptilian shapeshifters a la They Live, or like little gray men from the constellation Draco, it would actually explain a lot. Um, that is, of course, if the heliocentric infinite space hypothesis were actually true. Uh, but what if there are, in fact, others out there maybe not necessarily reptilian shapeshifters, admittedly, 
uh, but maybe like cousins of humanity peppered across the potentially infinite plane beyond the known reaches of our realm. It makes me wonder whether they were the invaders responsible for destroying the worldwide Tartarian Empire that we find evidence for all over the world, or were our ancestors the invaders who wiped out the native races of this place called Earth and the Americas was the most recent one? Food for thought. Uh, if that was the case, it would explain why the entities like the Smithsonian, responsible, supposedly responsible for preserving and promoting archaeological evidence, have been caught at best covering up and at worst destroying things like giant skeletons and giant skulls belonging to what can only be described as giant humanoids found all over the world. Uh, furthermore, it would explain why there seem to be psychopathic, non-human entities in the highest reins of power in our modern milieu. In any case, the one true creator of all things has been dormant in the hearts and in the faith of so many people for the last several generations at least, due to the bastardization of the goat herders of the Fertile Crescent who wrote the Bible and thought the earth was flat. Now that we have started the process of revelation, indeed just as predicted by the prophets, and also just as predicted by astrological axioms during this fresh new age of Aquarius, a renaissance of faith has also been sparked, which will kindle, then smolder, and hopefully within our lifetimes, burn this motherfucker to the ground. One love everybody, I'm gonna wrap this one up. I do appreciate you watching, hope that you enjoyed it. As always, this channel is viewer supported, so if you would like to contribute to the channel effort, uh, you can do PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, and Patreon for recurring monthly contributions. I'll put links in the description box below, but the keyword on all those is the Morgyle. Thanks so much, guys. As always, spread the word, spread the world, and peace out. One love.